Go on, guys. Don't block the picture. Yeah. yeah, perfect. It's just going to slide over here. All right. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for coming. We are here to announce the indictment of 10 people for their roles in a conspiracy in which large amounts of fentanyl and fentanyl analogs, as well as cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, and marijuana were shipped from Mexico to Cleveland, often to a house on East 106th Street. From there, the drugs were sold throughout Northeast Ohio, and the cash was sent to California and Arizona, where it eventually made its way back to Mexico. We want to highlight a, a couple things about the indictment and this group. First, the fentanyl and fentanyl analogs often came in the form of blue pills that were stamped to look like oxycodone. In one of several conversations monitored by law enforcement, the leader of this group, Jose Lozano, was asked how strong he wanted the pills on a scale of 1 to 10. Lozano replied that he wanted them to be an 8 or 9, but that he didn't want any overdoses. Another point, Lozano had this conversation from his cell at the Northeast Ohio Correctional Center, where he is currently serving an 18-month sentence for being in the United States illegally after having already been deported in 2017. Lozano was living in Painesville when he was picked up on the immigration charge, but he did not stop his drug dealing enterprise. He communicated directly with contacts in Mexico, including defendants Mario Hernandez and Salamente Gutierrez, to arrange for shipments of drugs from Mexico to Cleveland, sometimes via California. Lozano did this from a tiny cell phone that was smuggled into prison, and we thank our partners at NEOCC for their help in this investigation. And for anyone who thinks that contraband in prison in Contraband in prison is no big deal. Or people who think that illegally possessed cell phones in prison are no big deal. This case is an illustration of why we take that so seriously. Lozano is accused of running an international drug trafficking organization from his cell with the help of that contraband cell phone. Now, SAC Keith Martin from the DEA is going to provide more details about the investigation. Uh, but this group brought danger. Let me underline that. They brought danger from Mexico to Cleveland in the form of drugs that were labeled as one thing when they were in fact something that was far more dangerous. And it's another reminder to everyone, as if we needed to say this, but it's another reminder there are no such thing as safe drugs you buy on the street. If you buy a pill in 2019 in Northeast Ohio, it's not going to be what you think it is. It's going to have fentanyl in it. And it's also a reminder that the drugs that are sold on 105th and Union are not made on 105th and Union. We will work to stem the flow of drugs from Mexico, from China, and anywhere else. The Northern District of Ohio is our turf. This is our backyard. These 40 counties are our territory. And if you want to sell drugs here, there is nowhere you can hide. We are, we are committed to protecting our turf and our territory, every square inch of it. Whether that's on East 105th in Union, or if it's in a prison cell, we will protect our territory and we will find you if you are dealing drugs in the Northern District of Ohio. The DEA and our partners have done a tremendous job, and I'm going to turn it over to SAC Keith Martin uh, to fill you in on some additional details of the investigation. Thank you, Justin. Good afternoon. The events that took place today are the result of a 10-month-long DEA investigation which targeted Mexican cartel members operating not only here in Ohio, but across the country and in Mexico. One of the members of this organization, Jose Bernardo Lozano Leon, was incarcerated during the course of the investigation and was operating as command and control for Northeast Ohio while incarcerated. The investigation was coordinated with Warden Douglas Fender at the Northeast Ohio Correction Center located in Youngstown, Ohio, as well as our many law enforcement partners. I should mention a BCI agent assigned to the DEA Cleveland Task Force was instrumental in this investigation. This morning, we executed two search warrants and several arrest warrants. There were over 100 law enforcement officers involved in the operation today. The Mexican cartels continue to find ways to import drugs into the U.S. and ultimately Ohio. They were contaminating the streets of Ohio with blue pills designed to look like oxycodone and Percocet, but they were actually fentanyl. These pills were desi designed to deceive law enforcement and the street customers as well. As in all the cases, as in all these cases, there was no consideration for human life. They were only concerned with making a profit. 
In many instances, street customers believed they were buying oxycodone and Percocet. In reality, it was fentanyl. Throughout this investigation, we have seized kilograms of fentanyl, thousands of blue fentanyl tablets, heroin, cocaine, marijuana, crystal meth, and fentanyl analogs. All of these drugs were imported into the United States by the cartel, destined for Northeast Ohio. Let me be clear, the Mexican cartels only care about profits, not the citizens of Ohio. The DEA, along with our law enforcement partners, are attacking the infrastructure as well as the command and control of these organizations, whether they're operating in Ohio or Mexico. Our goal is to dismantle these organizations. We're going to put them in jail, seize their drugs, and their assets. The actions today sends a strong message to the Mexican cartels that law enforcement will not allow them to operate without consequences, and we are going to do everything in our power to keep the citizens of Ohio safe. This investigation is ongoing, and I anticipate there will be more arrests in the near future. Thank you. Okay, that concludes the uh, remarks portion. Are there any questions? We don't deal with street value. Um, no, nope. uh, we don't. We don't actually put a street value on it. But I mean, you know, fentanyl broken down, and if they're selling uh, thousands of pills at, let's say, they make make them at ten dollars a pill in Mexico, and sell them for thirty to sixty here, they're making pretty good money. Uh, not at this time. How did he get the cell phone? Um, we believe it was dropped off by a drone in the prison. Has that been something that you guys have seen very frequently there or in other jails, prisons, what have you? I can't comment on the prison, but I mean, it, I can tell you it was all coordinated with the warden, so. On in terms of drug smuggling, drug dealing, handling an operation inside a prison cell that's going on on the outside. I mean, what are you guys seeing in terms of drugs at any OCC? Yeah, again, Eric, I'm going to say you talk to the warden on that one. I mean, we're we're not in there. So Jose, he's the one who is, I guess, the ringleader, if you will, of this whole thing. And you guys said that he was um, he was already. No, he was incarcerated okay, already. So he was incarcerated, yeah, he, okay. At the time of the allegations in the indictment, he was incarcerated, serving a sentence for illegally re-entering the United States. So he's been removed previously, and then he illegally re-entered the United States. He was arrested on an immigration uh, offense, and he was uh, convicted of that and was serving a sentence at the time of the, the drug dealing activity that's outlined in the indictment. So then what happens now? Does he stay here and sort of face these charges? Are you guys trying to send him back again? He's, He's charged with uh, uh, with an additional offense related to drug tra uh, drug trafficking, and we'll let that one play out in the court. How many of them are in custody? Do you have the numbers on that? Uh, right now, eight are in custody. Do you know which ones are actually on the lam? Um, Clemente is in uh, Mexico, and I believe um, Amir down at the bottom, Evans is. Uh, is still out there. Um, and was that all seized today? No. Okay. No. What did you got? I mean, how many kilograms did you say? You just said kilograms. Are you able to tell me a good number? I can tell you it started with two kilograms of fentanyl. Can you guys sort of talk about the, I mean, we know that Northeast Ohio, all over the country, obviously, has been plagued with the opioid epidemic, right? Can you sort of talk about what something like Any one of those pills, 
uh, if they're taken by somebody who doesn't suspect that they have fentanyl in them, which is the vast majority of people who buy them on the street, they don't buy those pills thinking that they have fentanyl in them. They buy them thinking that they are, they've gone through a supply chain, they've been tested, they're stamped as oxycodone. That's why they buy them when, they're, uh, when we have forged pills like that. Um, and, and we know, again, we're not linking these particular um, traffickers with any overdoses or deaths at this point in time, but we do know that we have suffered uh, a number of overdoses just this year alone that have been linked to pills, uh, counterfeit pills and pills that contain fentanyl. So every single one of those pills, um, it, there's a potential for, for an overdose. When you're talking about fentanyl and you're talking about somebody who thinks that they're taking an oxycodone, uh, there's, there's no quality control around those pills. There's no testing of those pills. There's, there's nothing that goes into those pills that would be considered uh, anything that's pharmaceutical quality or something that you would safely put in your body. So, um, you know, whether or not we, ch we, have, we have charged any overdose deaths or any injuries associated with this tra drug trafficking ring, the seizure of those pills alone uh, absolutely saved lives. Those are, those are pills that otherwise would have ended up on the street and would have threatened the lives of people who are addicted, who are suffering from addiction, and who, who wouldn't have had a chance if they'd ingested one of those pills. When you have a defendant who's talking about a strength of eight or nine on a scale of ten, um, you know, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about in terms of, of public safety. Did some of the customers know that they were getting fentanyl? That, that's not our understanding. Again, I, I, we've, we, um, we know that um, people who, I mean, look, they stamp them so they look like oxycodone. Okay, that kind of says it all, right? If, if people went, wanted to go out there and buy fentanyl pills, they wouldn't bother putting a stamp on it. They wouldn't bother making them look blue and make them look like an oxycodone. So the whole point here is to uh, have customers think that they are buying what is a diverted or uh, an oversupplied pharmaceutical uh, and that they can put some trust in. Uh, but it really, we see this all the time now. These pills contain fentanyl if you're buying them on the street. Is there another sort of point to disguising them as oxy? I mean, is there a lesser drug charge if they get caught? I mean, would that It's a different substance. I mean, I mean it's, it's not fentanyl. If, if, you have, if you have oxycodone, it's, uh, it, it's, um, it's, a, it's a different controlled substance. Um, but I don't think that that's what's going on here. I think when you see, when you see pills that are counterfeit and are presented as oxycodone, that's because there's a certain demand for that particular product amongst people who are addicted to opioids. And the way that uh, our drug, drug dealers in 2019 are trying to address that demand is by putting fentanyl in pills instead of selling diverted or uh, oversupplied or stolen but pharmaceuticals. Like they're trying to like murder people. I mean, that's what, that, I mean, because we know that fentanyl is really the reason why a lot more people are overdosing these days. And putting out pills that are, you know, sort of this, uh, described as something else, mm -hmm. I mean, it just kind of seems like they're trying to murder people, well, honestly. And we, I mean, you can hear this from many of us up here. We make this point all the time. Uh, that's why we take these cases so seriously. That's why we pursue them as vigorously as we do. That's why we put so much resources into stopping them. Because uh, we have people, again, in 2019, who are willing to profit on death and destruction. That's what fentanyl dealers, that's what drug dealers do in 2019. They are profiting off of other people's pain, suffering, and their death and destruction. What if I touch one of those? If you touched one, I wouldn't recommend it. Would I be a better I mean, I don't know if like putting it in the pill form actually, you know, alleviates some of the issues. You know, you have when you're right. saying officer is exposed to fentanyl. Yeah. Well, look, we take I mean, we take all kinds of precautions. I don't know if you're referring to the medic standing by when we filmed another TV piece, but um, you know, we if if the DEA has fentanyl that they're going to be um, showing somebody or they're going to have available for somebody to to view. Um, their protocols require that they have a medic standing by in case there's an accidental overdose. Um, that's how seriously we take this stuff. It was a poor joke. My question was, though, you know, let's say, you know, somebody, a member of the general public mm -hmm. ends up trying to take one of these pills, and, you know, inevitably when you take a pill, you put it in your hand. Mm -hmm. Is there an adverse reaction that it takes rid of when you actually press it in that form, or is it, you know? I, I think... The technical point there would be if it's in a powder form, it's more easily aerosolized. It could be thrown up in the air. It could get ingested through somebody's uh, nostrils or mouth much more easily than if it's in a pill form. But, I, but I, I don't know if this is what you're getting at. Certainly not safer by any measure. Um, it's just dispersed and ingested in a different way than if it's in a powder form. And you made a reference to this real quickly, but I don't think that's what's in the indictment. Do you guys have information that he was actually doing this before he got locked up over in CCA? Before he got locked up in CCA? Yeah. Was this an operation he started before he got, he was in jail and continued once he was in there? 
Well, we'll just stick to what's in the indictment. I'm not gonna. I don't want to. I don't want to say anything else beyond what's in the indictment in terms of time frame. A lot of times we see these very large drug busts, right? And then we see another one, and then we see another one, and it just kind of seems like the drug bust happened. Then somebody else moves in, mm -hmm. and they take over the territory. Do you feel like you guys are putting a dent in the drug epidemic that we have all across the country? Well, we've said this repeatedly. We realize, everybody up here realizes that this is not a problem that's going to be solved through our enforcement efforts alone. It's something that we have to, to continue to do, though, and I'll tell you why. Because it gives our partners in public health, in uh, the first responder community, uh, in hospitals, in the healthcare uh, community, it gives them a chance to get some breathing space. If we can take off a ring that's dealing fentanyl uh, laced pills, uh, that will give us a chance and some time to deal with people who are addicted and suffering from addiction in a way that we wouldn't otherwise if, if there's a continual uh, uh, selling of pills on the streets. This gives us some space. Um, but yes, we, we're gonna, none of us are hanging up uh, the ha our hats tomorrow morning. We're going to get back out and get to work. Uh, we know that we have to continue to, to keep our efforts on and keep pushing on this front. I don't know if we have that. If it's not in the indictment, I'll okay. rely on the indictment. Okay. Okay. Can you talk about 106th Street? It was East 106th? Yes. What was going on there? Was it his residence? Was, was he warehousing? Were they selling out of it on 106th? You want to speak to that? Jamie? Yeah, I think it's important to understand that. Was he a danger to the neighborhood there? I mean, that's... Uh. Look, I'll, I'll, I'll comment on this. Um, you know, they were dealing in, in multiple different locations um, I'm not going to get into specifics of where but I will tell you that you know seizing thousands of those fentanyl tablets made a difference and I, I mean uh, we take that very seriously and they're made so well by the cartel that it takes a chemist to determine whether that's actual oxycodone percocet or fentanyl but so. you don't want to talk about it, they were storing them there or he was selling them? Well, out. I can tell you they were transporting them to several different locations, and that was one of them. So that was like a house where they just held them, it wasn't necessarily, well, I guess I'm just trying to figure out, like, is this a residence, is this a business? It's it's a, it, was it his house? Yeah. yeah. Well, it, I mean, it's, it's not a place that they were actively dealing out of, if that makes sense. Like, there weren't customers they were, like, coming. Stuff. Well, it, yeah, things were going to that residence, yes.